Support for Trail of History provided by Bragg Financial Advisors, providing portfolio management and comprehensive planning advice for high net worth clients and institutions. Committed to our clients and to our community. BraggFinancial.com. This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Historic downtown Statesville, North Carolina, the heart of Iredell County. Where one man's vast collection gives you a look back in time and shows Statesville as a quintessential American small town. Every time I come in, Steve's got something new. A massive assortment of historical photographs tell the story. Including uh, negatives and proofs, uh, probably uh, a half million. And memorabilia is on display, all from Iredell County, the good times and the not so good. We'll also meet a man who shares what life was like for African Americans in Statesville prior to the Civil Rights Act and what it was like to take part in school desegregation. We really didn't know what to expect going from an all black school to a predominantly white school. So none of us had any preparation for integration, none of us. And have you ever wanted to live life as a cowboy or cowgirl? Maybe even ride your horse to the local saloon? We keep our main street strictly for horses. We'll travel to North Iredell County and dive into the history of Love Valley, the self-proclaimed cowboy capital. So join us as we explore some of Iredell County's unique stories and history, from the early settlers to the area's once booming booze business, to even the current balloon business. That and so much more coming up on A Trail of History. Drive up and down the streets of Statesville or venture into the countryside of Iredell County and it might seem pretty easy just to take a breath and slow down. The county gets its name from American Revolutionary War veteran James Iredell. After the war, he served for a time as North Carolina Attorney General. Then in 1790, President George Washington appointed Iredell to the United States Supreme Court. But the county's history goes back even further. For thousands of years, Native Americans roamed this region from tribes such as the Shara and the Catawba, but that all changed during the 18th century when colonial settlers began to make their way into the Carolina backcountry. The, in the 1730s and 40s, like the Scotch-Irish and the Germans and a lot of people were coming into America, into Pennsylvania, and they, were being, they had to go out to the frontier because the, it had been the settled parts, the, the good land there was taken, and so the people gradually started working their way south. Making their way south along the Great Wagon Road and trading paths. The settlers came to this area in, uh, in the mid-1750s, uh, primarily from Ireland, uh, Scots-Irish Presbyterians looking for a new life. They uh, settled just up uh, half a block from here along the first Presbyterian church that they built. And uh, in the early days, the settlement was called Fourth Creek. Where First Presbyterian stands today in Statesville is the approximate site for the Fourth Creek Meeting House, the first colonial era church built in what eventually became Iredell County. Directly across the road, you'll find a historic cemetery known as the Old Fourth Creek Burying Ground. It's the final resting place for many early settlers, patriots, and even a U.S. congressman. Following the Revolutionary War, things started to change. In 1788, Iredell County was established, and in 1789, the Fourth Creek community became both Statesville and the county seat. But in the beginning, there wasn't much here. In those early days, it was primarily a crossroads for travelers, and uh, the uh, first businesses were taverns. But according to local historian Steve Hill, Statesville and Iredell County began to flourish. Its economy was based mostly on agriculture, which had surprising byproducts, alcohol and medicinal herbs. Statesville was probably one of the key liquor manufacturing towns in the Southeast during that time. We had uh, half dozen or so different companies here. And so it was, uh, and we had, uh, by that time, we had the railroad that we could ship it out. Uh, the Scots-Irish Presbyterians kind of had a love-hate relationship with alcohol. 
late 1880s, they uh, were very comfortable with uh, manufacturing alcohol in the liquor stills in northern Iredale County. Uh, they brought it to Statesville to be rectified, and then they, they bottled it up and put it in jugs and shipped it all over the southeast. They were fine with that. Uh, they, that uh, allowed them the, to ship the problems that went along with alcohol to other neighborhoods, uh, but yet uh, most of the mid to late 1800s, uh, it was a dry county as far as buying a, buying a drink at a bar. Farmers were not only making alcohol, but made a living by collecting items of medicinal value. Roots, herbs, plants, bark, seed, any kind of uh, medicinal types of uh, products that could be gathered uh, on the side of the mountain or in a field. Uh, in, in 1859, a couple of fellows by the name of, last name of Wallace moved to Statesville from Bamberg, South Carolina, and uh, they developed the root and herb market here. They had uh, gatherers who would uh, scour the, the hillsides uh, for product. Uh, they would take that product to their local stores and they would barter it for food, for eggs or, or whatever they needed. And then those uh, stores would ship it to Statesville and uh, it would be accumulated at the Wallace Brothers Herbarium, which at one point was the largest herb house or herbarium in the world. We have some, uh, some old jugs and, and bottles. Um, I, I like to tell people that Statesville, the, the big red buildings that we see downtown uh, were built, a lot of those were built with money that was made by the three vices, liquor, tobacco, and drugs. In downtown Statesville, you might find a building with a bright purple awning. It's home to the Statesville Historical Collection, and Steve Hill put it all together. I'm a retired educator, a former teacher, principal, assistant superintendent of the Idle Statesville School System, and I've been a lifelong collector. The collection takes up two entire floors of the old Gordon Furniture Store. Since learning to drive at 16, Hill says he's spent a lifetime expanding his collection. Uh, over the years, I've, that's basically what I've done on, on Saturdays, is just get out and, and look for, for these types of things. And uh, my children grew up uh, very patient with me. We, our, our uh, family vacations in the summer would revolve around an antique postcard show in Pennsylvania or a baseball memorabilia convention in Atlantic City or Chicago or something. So we tried to tie family into the, to the collection as well. My wife is, uh, she is tolerant of my uh, obsession. A massive part of his obsession, photographs. Thousands upon thousands of them. I'm a believer that every photograph tells a story and you need to try to look at that photograph and research it and find out what was going on at that time, what was going through that person's mind and try to relive history. Hill just wants to share it with as many people as possible so admission is free to the collection. It's really uh, moving some days to see someone come in and look through the photographs and say, that was my father, or that was my grandmother, or that was me. There's so much to take in when wandering the collection. Even ties to recent history are here. Go Back in the late 80s and early 90s, we, for some reason, became a hotbed for uh, made-for-TV movies for a while. And uh, we had several famous people who came through here, probably the most famous, Brad Pitt. His first credited movie role was in a movie that was filmed here. We've been able to rub elbows with some, some famous people along the way. From the famous to the infamous, there's the story of Tom Dooley. Tom uh, Dooley, D-U-L-A, had, uh, had served in the Civil War. He came back after the war, uh, went to Wilkes County, his home. Uh, where he had left behind a girlfriend or two or three. Uh, and that's kind of where his uh, life turned. One day, one of his girlfriends uh, went missing. They found her buried in a shallow grave. Uh, with, uh, she'd been stabbed in the heart. Uh, Tom was immediately suspected. They uh, figured they better uh, change the venue for the trial. So they moved the trial to, to Statesville. Uh, he was sentenced to hang and he was hanged 
uh, near the depot here in town in 1868. The story of Tom Dooley became the inspiration for a Kingston Trio song, and the late actor Michael Landon starred in the 1959 movie, The Legend of Tom Dooley. Another true event that's created a few ghost stories for Statesville happened right at the end of the 19th century. August of 1891, train pulled into Statesville. It was headed to Asheville. And it left town about uh, two or three o'clock in the morning as it crossed the th uh, Third Creek Railroad trestle. For some reason, it just fell off into the creek. Uh, 22 people were killed, eventually uh, died from that. At the time, it was the uh, worst train accident in state history. And of course, when you have a train wreck, you gotta have ghosts associated with it. So over the years, there have been ghosts that have been seen around the trestle. Those are just a few of the stories you'll learn about on a visit to the Statesville Historical Collection. It's a very nostalgic look at this small town, but Hill invited lifetime resident Skip McCall to give more perspective on life in Statesville. My name is actually Christopher Allen McCall. However, my grandmother gave me the nickname of Skip when I was a young boy. Actually, I was born in uh, Statesville, born in uh, South Statesville, which it is called now. At that time, it was called Rabbit Town. That was the name of the community. Statesville was uh, like many other uh, small southern towns. It was uh, a segregated community, and the community that I lived in was certainly totally segregated. Um, had very little uh, interaction uh, with the white community. As a young boy, uh, we stayed in our community. I very seldom even left our community. When asked, McCall leads school groups and others on walking tours of Statesville giving him a unique opportunity to offer perspective of what it was like growing up in the segregated South. Uh, when I was about six years old, uh, I would travel downtown with my grandmother. <laughs> Getting on the bus as a young boy, uh, there was this glass container that you would have to drop your money in when you get on the bus, and I think it was only a nickel. When we'd get on the bus, and I would want to stay up front and watch that money, my grandmother would always grab me right here by in the back of my collar <laughs> and pull me and say, come on here, boy, come on back here with me. And we would walk to the back of the bus and sit down. And then I would sit back there and I would watch as young white kids would be up front doing what I wanted to do. Then there was the water fountain. I remember going with my grandmother downtown and uh, sometimes I would get thirsty. She said, don't forget, drink from the colored fountain. She had taught me that. So I went over there and there was two water fountains. One was a white water fountain and one was for color. And I would usually, I always would drink from the color, but for some reason, the curiosity just got the best of me. And I was like, what's the difference between the white and the color water fountain? So I did, I looked around to make sure there was nobody watching. And I took a quick sip of the water from the white water fountain. And to my amazement, <laughs> it tasted just like the water coming from the color water fountain. In high school, McCall was part of the first class to integrate Statesville High School, where he faced a situation that changed his life. I went to an all-black school up until my senior year. <laughs> Morningside Elementary, Morningside Junior High, even Morningside High School until my senior year. And it was my senior year uh, that the court ordered uh, desegregation of Statesville. McCall says in the beginning, things on the surface appeared to be okay, but in reality, there was a tension, and eventually found himself in an altercation with a white student. Mr. Hyatt, who was the principal, came up behind me and grabbed my wrist, and he said, don't do that, please don't do that. And he took my knife and took me to the office. That was a real 
real scary situation. But it's what happened next that sets McCall on a new path, thanks to a principal willing to listen. When he took me to his office, he and I started to talk. Uh, and I shared with him uh, some of the feelings and things that we as black students were going through and dealing with. And actually, we started a conversation that went on just about every day. From those conversations, the principal called for an assembly, one in which McCall spoke to his classmates. He said, I think you should speak. I said, I don't know what to say. He said, I'll tell you what, tell them the same thing that you've been telling me. <laughs> and so I said, OK, I can do that. And I got up and spoke to the student body. And it was amazing. Everything after that assembly, everything started to really settle down. And because of that, and the dialogue and conversation that me and Mr. Hyde uh, were having, I think uh, enabled us uh, to get through the remainder of that year and go on to graduate. For more than a century, baseball has been called America's national pastime, and that's true here too, where the Statesville Historical Collection baseball memorabilia is prominently displayed. Former college history instructor Bill Moose. Baseball, people love to play it. Uh, we had uh, all kinds of baseball teams here. We had uh, mill teams. There were, there were local leagues that played. Had professional baseball from 39 to 42, and then 43 and 44, which was the roughest parts of the war for manpower. There wasn't one. It came back in 45. And then after the war, it had a, it had a resurgence. And then when television came in, that began to draw people away from the ballparks because they could get their ball on TV. Statesville had its fair share of professional players. His name is Leonard Lewis Lindsay, and he ended up playing in the Negro Leagues. He did a lot of just minor league, what would be in essence minor league or semi-pro semi playing. He played a full season in 42 and a full season in 43. Skip McCall recalls baseball's importance in Statesville's African-American community. And so baseball was a big part of the black community because there wasn't a lot of things that were available to us to do um, and, and to, you know, have, have gatherings and just have a good time at it. And those were some of the best times, I'm telling you. <laughs> then there was... Tom Zachary was a pitcher that played here in 1916. And he went on and had a really good major league career. And the thing that he probably, it's not the thing that he would like to be remembered for, but the thing that he is probably most remembered for, he is the guy who gave up Babe Ruth's 60th home run in that record-breaking season. In northern Iredell County, one man didn't have dreams of playing baseball. No, Tori Barker's grandfather had other ambitions. Uh, my grandparents are Andy and Eleonora Barker. They both served in World War II. Um, my grandmother was in the Navy. My grandfather was in the Army. Grandfather uh, always wanted to live in a cowboy town. He kind of was a cowboy at heart and um, proclaimed in the fourth grade that when he grew up, he was gonna be a cowboy and build his own town. The year was 1954, and Barker, originally from Charlotte and a builder by trade, was in the area while working on a construction project. Came to this area and decided this was it. Um, he bought the initial 300 acres, went home, told my grandmother that they were moving, and they put their farm up for sale, and that's, the rest is history. Barker called his town Love Valley. The first building he built was this church up on a hill. And then he lined Main Street with buildings straight out of an old western. Daddy just wanted to be somewhere um, that he felt like he could be his own person. So he started having rodeos. And of course, we built the town. Now it was 
responsibility for the whole family. All four of us had different responsibilities. My brother, at a very young age, started helping Daddy build buildings. I had a concession stand at the rodeos. I had a popcorn machine. Everybody learned square dancing. So we did square dancing in the middle of the arena. And it was so much fun. I mean, His daughter, Tonda Barker Trevette, says the Western lifestyle was front and center. Case in point, horseless carriages aren't allowed to drive on Main Street, but there's plenty of parking for horses. Today, the town's population is about 100 full-time residents, but Tori Barker says Love Valley has so much to offer the horse enthusiast. The town itself is probably around 600 acres, um, and then another 2,000 acres of all privately owned land that people can ride horses on um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we have lots of events throughout um, the summer. Mostly our busy time is Easter to Halloween. We host lots of rodeos. Um, we actually have our own rodeo association for the youth here, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, we have outdoor music and, and all that, but primarily you're right, it's, it's a horse town um, and we want people to enjoy that life. In July of 1970, a year following the famous Woodstock Music Festival, the Barkers hosted their own rock festival, the Love Valley Thing. The festival held here at the arena featured the Allman Brothers. Photographer Ken Powers documented the next few years following the festival and recalled it having a very 70s vibe. After the concert, a lot of the people decided to stay in the area because they just liked it. And um, they ended up developing the town and setting up things like health food stores. There was a couple of bars in town that became a very unique place. And I eventually moved up there and uh, rented a cabin from Dickie Betts for a while. It was while living in Love Valley, Ken Powers, in a roundabout way, helped bring the ballooning industry to the area. The problem was there was no jobs for these people, very, very few. And so in 1973, uh, I was uptown with a friend of mine, uh, and we saw this gentleman walking downtown that we didn't recognize and just struck up a conversation with him. And he said his name was Tracy Barnes, and he was thinking about coming to the area to uh, set up a balloon factory. And that's exactly what Barnes did inside this converted chicken house a few miles south of Love Valley. He was a very interesting man. He had held the world's altitude record at the time uh, in a hot air balloon. Uh, he had uh, was the first person to fly from the west coast to the east coast in a hot air balloon. Barnes, along with other balloon enthusiasts, planted the seeds for what's now the second oldest balloon rally in North America, the Carolina Balloon Festival, held each fall in Iredell County, a marquee event that spotlights this community. But for all the celebrities, rodeos, hippies, high-flying balloons, and horse shows, in the end, for Tori Barker, Love Valley will always be about her family's legacy. This place is a very interesting place, and we tend to get a very eclectic group of people that come here. Every single week, no matter what, there is a horse and a rider and somebody enjoying these beautiful mountains. My grandfather wanted to have a place where anyone could be welcome or was welcome anytime. Um, he loved people, which is why it's called Love Valley. And he, and he just was so great with people and, and he had a lot of help, but he always stayed focused on what the end result was, which was a place for families to come and enjoy and a place um, where you felt like you were traveling back into time and where it was okay to be a cowboy, even if it was just for the weekend. Statesville continues to offer Southern charm in a city steeped with history. History that's on full display for visitors to see. And up in Love Valley, you can still experience 
even for just a little bit, what life was like during simpler times. And back in Statesville, a local resident's legacy still takes to the skies each year to showcase this city and county to the region and to the world. Thank you for watching this episode of Trail of History. of PBS Charlotte.